you guys ready for a little different type of a word of God today? I want to invite today my beautiful wife, Pastor Tanya, to come to the stage. Would you give her a hand as she comes? Come on, Pastor Tanya. Have a seat. I couldn't do this without her. She, she does so much of the background work at the church. She's a women's pastor. She, she meets with a lot of women. She is, uh, she oversees social media and discipleship and different things. So, uh, like I said, I couldn't do it without her. She's such a blessing to the church. She's but not. You're my biggest project. I'm, I'm sure. Working on. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I better sit down. And uh, uh, we, we co pastor this church. So it's not like Pastor Alex and Pastor Tanya is somewhere behind. No, we, we, we pastor together. And uh, what a blessing. Uh, yeah, just, yeah. He's speechless, which I am never speechless. happens. <laughs> Amen. Well, today we're going to talk about marriage. And uh, the topic uh, we, we want to talk about is marriage goals. But the under topic, how to build a marriage you don't want to leave. Mm. If you're young today uh, and single, or if you're not uh, young but single, uh, this message is also for you it's not just for married people because you start building your marriage before you get actually married right. amen and so uh i have a few things i want to read uh, great marriages are built not magic the world says that marriages are supposed to be magic no but Great marriages are built. It takes work to build something. It takes intention, planning, strategy, right, to build something. Uh, uh, it's easy to destroy a marriage, though. Yes. It's easy to destroy a marriage. So if you want marriage to be like heaven on earth um, or as close to it, you have to work at it. You have to build it. If you just think it's supposed to be easy, well, then you will easily lose it. Mm -hmm. Amen. So today we want to share a few secrets that we've learned over almost 21 years in our marriage. Um, Can I just say yeah. that just because we're sitting here doesn't mean that we always had a perfect marriage. Doesn't mean that we have a perfect well, marriage. Well, tell us, how, 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 how did our marriage start it? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, you always like to say that w the first year of our marriage was beautiful to, for me. To you, yeah, and so. And then I found out it's not good for you. Because I was not, uh, I was not good for me because I did not speak up. I didn't ask for what I needed, what I wanted. I was miserable that whole. I feel like it was longer than a year, but could have been a year. <laughs> and so, like, I want to say, you know, be, like to couples, if you feel like, oh, we have a, we have a good marriage. No, we're good. Like people said, it's hard, but it's actually not. Well, ask your spouse because they might have a different opinion a different view. story so uh, for me it felt like the uh, first year was great uh and then i found out that she doesn't like a lot of stuff <laughs> that i'm doing the my controllingness my boldness and i remember seeing a counselor and the counselor said to me you're too bold you need to bring it down a little bit and he told her you're you're a uh what is this ostrich hiding your hand and head in the sand you're a turtle actually he named you a turtle and that's where you got the nickname I call her my turtle because in a store, if you see us walking, I would be like three or four feet in front. And, and it's always like that. You know, she's just slower than I am. Uh, she's never on time. <laughs> well, most of <laughs> you were told it might get messy. So, <laughs> yes, yes. And he told her, hey, you need to speak up. You need to pull your head out of the shell and you need to, you know, show yourself because she would hold it and hold it and hold it and then snap. And then it would be ball and tears and, and it, just a lot of emotions. Yeah. And so today, that's, uh, we want to give you a few just little tips that we've learned and uh, what's the goal of marriage. If you're not married, you should make this, what we're talking about, goal of your marriage. If you are married and maybe you don't know why you're married, uh, this will explain a little bit more. <laughs> Amen. Is this how it's going to be for the rest of my life? So what is marriage? What is marriage? I actually Googled this, and um, there was not a lot of answers. Like, it talked about what marriage does, but what is marriage? Well, I found one that I've actually had a hard time finding, but uh, Timothy Keller says marriage is a lifelong monogamous relationship between a man and a woman. Okay? Um, Rabbi Freeman, uh, the author of a book, Joy of Intimacy, uh, he says that marriage is a voluntary bond between man and a woman. And I asked you, what did you say the marriage was? Go ahead. 
I said marriage is a covenant between a man and a woman with each other and God. Amen. It's a covenant. It's not a contract because contract is you protect yourself and your rights. Yeah. Right? Covenant is you, pro you protect the other. Mm -hmm. When you make a covenant with somebody, you said, I will protect you when you're in trouble. Contract is like, well, it, it's designed to protect my interests, my money, my well-being, mm -hmm. but not the covenant. And marriage is a covenant, not a contract. And I think it's important to understand that aspect that it does involve God because it is a God idea. And although sometimes people, you know, get married, they don't involve God. But marriage idea, marriage, you know, the way it was created, it doesn't, it's a covenant between a man and a woman and God. That's yeah. really important. And there has been an attack on marriage, mm -hmm. especially in the last, uh, you know, 100 years. There's been such an attack on marriage because the enemy knows the power. When there's strong marriages, there's strong children, healthy right. children. When there's strong marriages, uh, it's better for society. It's better for our government. It's better for the nation, strong marriages. Yeah. But you separate people, and then you, you, you make children stop respecting parents, and then society just breaks down. And first, uh, they taught the children to disrespect parents. Then they taught people to disrespect authority pastors and now what do you think it came after them now nobody respects government or kings or president nobody respects anybody anymore and so we're so fractured and divided and it's bad for our society because uh, um, can two go without agreement bible says and uh, a house divided between itself cannot stand and our nation is in a dangerous place because our homes are divided Amen. Amen. So why do people get married? Let's, let's just talk about this. Why do people get married? Um, I'm, I want to drop some naked truth, if that's oh, okay. Oh I think if you ask the world, they will say to be happy and not lonely. If you ask a woman, she would say... For love, because I'm in love. I love him. Okay, for love. So she is marrying for love, for affection, for romance. So he could spend hours listening to her like this, looking in her eyes, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, for, for that affection. That's what women say. Mm -hmm. And if you ask a man, why did you get married? He will also say for love. <laughs> but a different kind of love. You know, in Greek, there's different types of love. And one of them is called eros, erotic love. And if guys are honest, they will say, well, I don't want to be lonely, and I want to have that. Hmm. Cookie. Wow. That's so shallow. So shallow. Sounds shallow, right? Are, are guys shallow? Horrible. <laughs> so are women. So are women. What if I told you a woman only married a guy for his money? What would you say? Shallow. Shallow. What if I said a man married a woman for her looks? What would you say about him? Shallow. Yeah. What if I told you a woman married a man for, for love? Oh, so noble. <laughs> the truest. What's the difference if she married him for love or for money? Hmm. Money won't last. <laughs> Actually, money will last longer, longer than, than many love. love. <laughs> Actually, money lasts longer than marriages. That's why we write prenups. We don't, but, you know, <laughs> people write prenups. So what's the difference of him marrying for looks and her marrying for love? Some of you are like, I'm ready to grab a stone and stone you, pastor. <laughs> there is no difference. Well, what about St. Paul says, husband, love your wife. There's difference of you loving with, or marrying for love. Do you see this? You, notice people don't say, I'm marrying him because I want to love her, spend the rest of my life with her, take care of her, you know. I want to give love. No, 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 we marry for love. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between marrying for love. Marrying for love is like marrying for money or for beauty or for influence mm -hmm. or for power. Like in old days, people married for power. King Solomon, how many women did he marry? To gain and consolidate power with other nations. Mm -hmm. So it's basically what I'm saying is that 
I'm marrying you, and as long as you make me feel good, you produce love, you produ produce that feeling, um, and that feeling makes me happy, then I will stay married to you. But as soon as y there is no love anymore, right? Then, then I'm done with you. Then I don't have to be married to you. That's why so many marriages are hurting today. That's why so many, we have so many confused marriages in our world today. Because people marry for happiness. Because the world says, if you're not happy, we love each other, but we're not happy. So we're going to split up. We have irreconcilable differences. We're going to split up. I'm not getting sex, so I'm going to go find it somewhere else. See, if you marry for anything other than what we're going to talk about today, the goal of marriage, it's a wrong reason. So, how, what do we marry for? So, what does the Bible say about marriage? What's the goal of marriage? Let's open to Genesis 2.24. You know this verse. Okay, here's what it says. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. There is a secret, one word, purpose, and what you should build your marriage on. What is it? Help me out. What? One word. One, united. Who else? Out of that verse, God gives us a clue. What is the purpose? What does God build marriage for? Notice it doesn't say love there. Right. Sex there. Although there must be love in marriage. Mm -hmm. Doesn't say sex. There must be intimacy in marriage. Mm -hmm. Doesn't say looks. Adam couldn't choose any other. <laughs> That's all he had. Um, I believe that one purpose is, the, is oneness. oneness. The Bible says the goal of marriage is one to be one two becoming one and if you make it anything else you will be disappointed make happiness the goal of your marriage and you will be disappointed make great sex the goal of your marriage and you half of the time you will be disappointed women you'll be disappointed more than half of the time make beauty the goal of your marriage beauty fades wrinkles come on the faces yeah. He will gain weight. She will gain weight. Make it about beauty, and beauty is fleeing. Make it about her body, and the body changes. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is the fact, guys. When you marry, your woman most likely will gain weight. So it's stupid to think, no, not my girl. Of course. Of course your girl. And you will gain weight too. Not unless you have that weird, what is it, uh, metabolism but most of us we just have regular metabolism we gain uh, weight and lose hair well at least we lose hair on our head and gain a lot on our body and so when you are just I'm marrying for beauty you will be very disappointed you will always be looking is there somebody better for me out there if you marry for anything other than what God designed it for. The mystery of oneness. Actually, St. Paul didn't even understand this mystery of oneness. Ephesians, let's open that quickly. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. Here's what it says. Uh, go ahead, babe. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Just one more phrase. This is a great mystery. See, secret, mystery. That oneness, what is it? It's a secret, it's a mystery. I think Paul wasn't married, so he couldn't understand that. <laughs> but what is that, being one? That takes a little bit of unfolding. And that's what we want to do a little bit today. And maybe in your life groups, you can talk more about what does it mean. Maybe when you're driving home, maybe when you're going on a date this week with your spouse, talk about how can we become one because the goal of marriage is not happiness the goal of marriage according to the bible is oneness so what is oneness can you help what is oneness what is oneness well 
the the best way that I can describe is I feel like I I I I feel some of that oneness after 21 almost 21 years of marriage uh, in the Bible when uh, God brought Eve to Adam. Uh, Adam says something like this, whoa, you know, she came from me and we're one with her and um, she's so beautiful. And I always thought kind of that he, when he saw Eve, he thought and he said that she's so beautiful. She's opposite of me. She's so curvy and so hot and all those things. But when we were getting ready for this message, when I read that scripture, it jumped out at me. And I think what Adam really meant is he, he said, how can two people be apart, be whole, be full. That's really important, being complete mm -hmm. without your partner. But then when you're together, you're one. And that was the, the first and the only perfect couple in the world. And then there was, since then, there was never, has ever been a perfect couple. But I think it's that, you know, when you look and you, because we're so different. Oh. We're so opposite. Yes. But then we have those moments. It's not a whole life, but we have those moments of just that unity and oneness. And it's 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 pleasure. It's great. It's great to feel that with another human being. Okay, I would say for me it's a little bit different. Oneness. Okay. Uh, it's not based on what you feel. It's not based on whether uh, I feel chemistry with you or not. It's that foundation of our marriage. It's that thing where I can exist without you. Mm -hmm. I could probably hire a maid to, you know, wash my clothes and take care of my house. But it wouldn't be a life. Mm -hmm. It would be existence. You know the difference between existence and life. Existence is we're taking space. A rock exists. But when a rock is put in a building and holds the roof, then the rock is alive. And Jesus Christ said, I have come to give you life to the fullest. What did he mean by that? He wasn't talking about life that we didn't have life but we didn't have life right. he was talking about uh, you, you he knew we have existence we exist but he says i want to give you life i want to give you purpose i want to give you something more yeah. to the fullest yeah. and that's what you can gain money you can build a great business you can have great success and fame and all you have is existence but when you begin to use your uh your yourself to help others to to fulfill the purpose in this world you become alive mm -hmm. yeah. you become alive and i say there's only two options for successful people they either go crazy and destroy themselves with pleasure or two they find a cause what did you say we had dinner this friday and you said somebody said that the difference between a, a happy person and a miserable person is a noble cause is a noble cause the difference between a happy person and a miserable person is a noble cause. Because a happy person, when they became successful or whatever, uh, when they had their basic human needs met, they turned and helped somebody else. Okay, for us, it's bringing close, people closer to Jesus. For many of you as Christians, it's to bring people closer to God. It's to worship God. We have a purpose. We're not just purposeless. But imagine making billions of dollars and that's it. You feel so empty inside. You have everything. You, you might have a perfect life. But why are you so miserable inside? Okay. And so for me. I'm sorry. Long rabbit trail. I'm almost. Oneness. Is I can exist without you. But I don't want to. I can exist without you. But it's no life without you. Notice there's nothing about love, nothing about sex yet. It's that oneness. So goal for marriage, young people, when you're looking for a partner, look for a person you could be one with. And so the Bible says is the goal is oneness. The ultimate goal of a healthy biblical marriage is oneness not happiness you can write that down the ultimate goal of a biblical marriage any marriage even if you're not a believer is oneness not happiness and the, that's opposite what the world says right, I feel some like of you are like what that doesn't sound right i want to be happy mm -hmm. the goal of marriage is oneness and not happiness because oneness 
Go ahead. You, you talk about Well, when you work towards happiness, right, then you, you, when you find yourself in a situation where you're not happy, you jump out because it doesn't make sense. If your goal is to be happy, then when you encounter a, a problem, you encounter a um, season when you're not happy, you're going to remove yourself because the goal is to be happy, right? Like, yeah. I just want to kind of drill that in. If the, yeah. if the goal is happy, then when I'm not happy, I'm out. I'm going to find something, someone who is going to make me happy. But if the goal is oneness, unity, then my unhappy has nothing to do. Then With my marriage. Right. So I want to get a little bit um, vulnerable and get a little bit honest. And I hope that it blesses you. Um, there was a season in our marriage where I felt very unhappy very unhappy and uh, didn't want to come home. I would be driving home and I would be dreading it, did not want to see him. Every time I saw him, I just was like the opposite of love, the opposite of affection was going. So there's a season of hate in marriage even. Yes, I, that's, I experienced that. I don't know, you told me that you still loved me, but at that moment, I did not I like I loved you, him. but I did, did not, not like you did not a like lot. You, did not love you, none, none of that. Didn't want nothing to do with you. You were not making me happy. I was not happy. And um, there was this other man who came into my life. And he was a godly good man. He brought me closer to Jesus. And he made me so happy. Just so happy. When I was with him, you know, the way he treated me. What do you me, mean you were with him? Well, we were. We were <laughs> when you were around him. Around him, yeah. Okay, around thank him. You. <laughs> thank you for. <laughs> you said it in a first service, and I was like. And then somehow we got off the It is topic. what it is. The Lord is yeah. going to use it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, and, in, and in that moment, if I am looking to be happy because he was not making me happy, this other guy was making me happy, um, what's the natural? The natural is to, to change, right? He, to he was making you feel happy. Feel he wasn't happy. really making you yeah, happy. He wasn't he, paying your bills. Yeah, he didn't know me. And credit me. cards. He didn't know me. Okay. <laughs> he didn't know me. <laughs> I had to correct it. And so I just want to paint this picture because in life sometimes we, we swallow a lie. Mm -hmm. We swallow a lie and we live out of a lie and then we have a result as disaster and we sit there and, and we don't learn. We will go on making the same mistake over and over. So it's maybe you've made a mistake. That's okay. It's good right now to slow down, to stop and say that, I did in the past. Couples, ma ma you know, married couples, come on. We have made that our, our happiness our idol. We've made that. If I'm not happy, I don't want to be here. We'll make your life miserable. But if at that moment I had a decision to make, I, because marriage is a covenant for me between a man and a woman and a God. So at that moment, I did not care about my covenant with my husband. I honestly didn't care. But I, d I still had my covenant with my God, and I could not break that. And so I had to repent, I had, I had to come and confess, and change my mindset and said, okay, I'm not happy, but what do I do now to be one with this man? Amen. So, if you seek oneness in marriage and make it the goal, you will find happiness. Not 24-7, not, yeah. not 365 days a year happiness. There's no such a thing in this world. But you will find happiness if you seek oneness. But if you seek oneness, you will be the most miserable person because well, one day you'll have... If you see happiness. If you seek happiness, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. See? Uh, if you seek happiness and tomorrow you go through a hard season in your life, season of depression, season of sickness, what are you going to do then? Well, I'm not happy. I'm not happy today, so I'm going to go look. And my, 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 uh, the other lady from church makes me happy. The other lady at work makes me happy. A lot, another man makes me so happy, makes me feel happy. And then people jump out. And a lot of marriages are destroyed. And then children struggle. And then society struggles. And, and so on and on. So if you seek oneness, you will find happiness most likely. Because happiness is hidden in oneness. If you seek happiness, you will not find oneness. Because happiness is a result of something. So when marriage is about oneness, it could survive any diversity. Yeah. Almost any diversity. When marriage is about happiness, oh, it's on a shaky ground. It's like building your life on sand, Jesus said. Okay? So 
build marriage on oneness because marriage on oneness can survive the season of when you hate her. What? That doesn't happen in Christian marriages. No. Oh, yes, it does. There is a season when you just hate that person. There's a season when you don't like that person. When there's a season when you don't love that person. Don't, don't, don't love that person. There's a season when that person is sick. Happiness cannot survive a sick spouse right. long term. Right. But oneness can. Mm -hmm. There's a season of mistrust and unforgiveness and credit card debt and secret debt and, and secret stash you find out, you know, uh, right? There are seasons of tragedy. There are seasons when he lost all the money gambling mm -hmm. or at least $5,000 that was in your savings and you find out. Oneness can somehow survive these things. There's a season of when children come. Happiness, often man is like, oh, she's all into children. I, I cannot. So see, oneness can survive beauty and wrinkles. Right. Happiness only survives beauty. Mm. Oneness can survive that time of the month. <laughs> and at other time of the month. Oneness can survive when you feel like roommates. And when you feel like brother and sister, oneness can survive that. Mm -hmm. Happiness, if your goal is happiness or love, I want love. If your goal is sex, well, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's often. Some, in the beginning, it's every day, twice on weekends, right? <laughs> Then, then it just, you know, twice a week, then it's whatever, whatever. But oneness can survive. We're one. We have same hobbies. We have same faith. That's another thing. How do you become one if you don't have the same faith? Oh, that's that faith is so private. And often my wife prays for me. It's the best moment for, for me before the service. You didn't today, but often you do. You just grab me. And just say, let me pray for you. And in the office, she prays for me there. And often at night, I would pray for her. And I'm going to say, yeah, the sexiest thing you do in bed is when, when I, I'm falling asleep and I can hear him pray for me. I, I feel like, you know, I got somebody in my corner. I got somebody I, that loves me and somebody who is bringing me out before God and supporting me through what I'm going through. So that's, Amen. Uh, if you look at happiness, it's like... Um, Imagine a, a, a dash, a, a board, you know, a, a, what do you call that? You know, um, on your, in your car you have um, Dash the dashboard, right? Yeah. Like where you see different signals. And so um, happiness is just like a little signal you're getting. You know, when you're unhappy, if you're, in, if you're married today and you're like, I am unhappy, I have good news for you. You are in a perfect position to start working towards oneness. This is good news. If you're feeling unhappy, all that means is that you guys haven't been really working towards oneness. And your dashboard is telling, eh, 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 you know, something is not right in our marriage. Let's start working on oneness. So don't be discouraged if you don't feel happy. This is today. You can make a decision and go make a list. And we're going to talk and teach about that um, in coming weeks, how to become one and, and get closer and work on that oneness. I have an example. Building your marriage on happiness, love, or sex, or beauty, or money, whatever, is like only going to work when it's 70 degrees and no cloud in the sky, just sunshine. Make sense? Yeah, I only go to work when it's good weather. When it's nice. What about the rest of the time? Mm. When Sometimes it rains for a week. Are you going to skip work? Your wife is going to kick you out of the house. You're not providing security. She can't respect a man who, who doesn't work. Guys, by the way, women don't respect men who don't work. <laughs> who can't provide that security for her. And I know all of you are working on providing that for your spouses. Oneness can cure loneliness. Oneness can survive tragedy, pain, and suffering. Because there's plenty. Over the, you know, you, most people will be married 40, 50, 60, 70 years right oneness can survive all the the seasons that you will experience happiness is not the only season you will have in your life right. young people if you, happiness is not only season there's health there's children problem there's all kinds of things 
but oneness can. But if you are one, we're a team, we're one. And when eventually I imagine one of uh, uh, dying and the other says, it's just no life without you. I'm alive, but it's just not the same. Mm-hmm. That's what oneness is. Happiness can handle pain and suffering, which there are plenty in any marriage. So now, how do you get and keep this oneness that will produce long-term happiness? How do you get that oneness? I would say make it your goal. Mm -hmm. This is the vision for our marriage. Men, you have a vision for your business. We have a vision for the church, bringing people closer to Jesus. Right? What is the vision for your marriage? I think that's going to change our arguments. You know, mm-hmm. when, when we're arguing for something, usually we're arguing for happiness because I won't be happy until I get what I want. Yeah. But if we are arguing, you know, because there's arguments need to happen in life because we need to decide things. Um, and if we, are, we, we stop and we say, what's the goal for me to be right or for us to solve this and get closer to oneness? Do you see how our arguments are going to go on a whole another level? I mean, it's gonna, it takes practice and you fall back and you forget, you know, why are you doing this? Because you want to be right. But if you make that your goal, then you are going to be working. Not, I might not be happy at the moment with this decision. This might not feel good for a couple of weeks when, or months when you put me on a strict, strict budget. Uh, it did not feel good at all. I was not happy at all. It wasn't that strict. It then. was strict. It was very strict. I had to save on groceries to go do my hair. It was very strict. So, <laughs> so but, but the, the goal was... To, to grow to one is because we were divided when it came to finances. We were really divided. And we need to get unhappy so we can get to Yeah, we had two oneness. different visions for finances and, uh, and almost anything else. Politically, we had two different visions. And we've been kind of getting closer. You, you've, you've been surprising me. <laughs> anyway, okay. Uh, so how do you get and keep this oneness? Make it a goal. Number two. The Bible says you have to leave something you love more than anything. For a man who's getting married, what does he love more than anything? Freedom. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, I meant That's mom good. and dad. That's good. Freedom. Yeah. You have to leave freedom. That's very good. We're going to use it in the third service. Uh, you have to be able to leave your friends. It doesn't mean that you let go of your freedom. You just put it in a second place. It doesn't mean you just abandon your mom and dad completely. No, you put them in second place. Because remember, you cannot be one with anybody else in the world. You cannot be one with your children. You cannot be one with your mom and dad. Oneness is between a man and woman is the greatest relationship in your life. Remember I said last week, family is the most important. Well, when you get married, your family is more important than even your biological family you everything sometimes you have a best friend guys and and you meet a girl or he meets a he meets a girl and suddenly he puts you in a second place and you are upset and you're trying to fight like why why are you not answering my calls why aren't we hanging out like we used to why aren't we clubbing like we used to and i want to tell you that's normal that's how God created it he has to leave you or at least put you on a second place so don't fight for first place anymore when he found somebody she has to be he has to be number one the Bible says a man must leave his father and mother and be cleaved to his wife or joined to his wife go ahead can I just quickly say something about leaving you have to leave and grieve for your singleness because a lot of times we think that I'm just going to get married and every, er, life is going to go on. I'm just going to have this guy with me. Like he's just going to go with me shopping for hours. You know, it's just going to, it's going to be great. But the fact is that we, we lose our singleness. When you, you, we change status, you will never be single. And sometimes it, you have to take that time to realize it, to grieve it and say goodbye to it. And when I hear people say that, you know, oh, my spouse is so controlling. They're calling me so much and, and checking up on me. I want to say, you're married. Some are because there's insecurity there. But still, there, I, I agree. And that's a personal thing, you know, that people should work on personally. But if your spouse calls you and checks up on you, asks, you know, how did your day go? Why were you late for dinner? It's because you're married. You're not single. You know, you, they get to. So, and sometimes you have to change your perspective, how you, 
how you perceive thinking. that. Yeah. If you perceive that as control, you will be irritated every time you get a phone call, every time you get a question, why are you late? But if you understand that now I'm married to this person, I got somebody who cares about me. I got somebody who thinks about me. For the rest of my life, they will be thinking and caring about me. Then this could be actually a good thing. Somebody thinks about me. This is not control. Amen. Do, you, do you see how that, you know, that yeah, on one side person could be feeling I'm control, you know, like they're, they need to be checking up on somebody because they have trauma of, you know, somebody cheating on them. But on the other side, if I perceive you as, con no matter what you do, yeah. I will perceive it as control. Yeah. So, uh, single people, when you get married, you have to upgrade your brain. Like you upgrade your phone to, yeah. to a newer, yeah. so you have to upgrade your brain. Okay, I give up my singleness. Yeah. I give up my some of my freedom, or at least it goes on the second place. Mm -hmm. I give up my mom and dad. They go on second place. Yeah. I don't lose them, but they, they're put on the second place. Same for women. Mom and dad, because some, some, sometimes a uh, mother-in-law will ruin uh, a marriage because the daughter has never, or son never separated, le never left. Mm -hmm. And so the mom still speaks in the marriage. So it doesn't matter what that spouse, other spouse says. Mom tells, you know, and it creates a lot of uh, uh, drama and trauma in, in marriages as well. So you have to leave. Number two, you have to cleave or to join to your spouse. Can you read us a uh, definition of what it, does it mean to uh, join together in Hebrew? What is the Hebrew meaning? So here is, here is where, what it is. What does it mean to cleave? From the text in Genesis 2, it means to adhere, to, to stick to, to be attached by some strong tie. You might be thinking, yes, that's me, I'm stuck. But that's, that isn't the meaning here. In the original Hebrew, this verb, for, uh, this verb form speaks of doing something aggressively. You're not just stuck. You're not just stuck in a thing. You're aggressively. In other words, you're not stuck to something like a fly in a flypaper, trying to get loose. Rather, you're holding on. Imagine walking along an edge of a cliff and suddenly losing a footing. As you go over the side, you grab a branch and hold on to it. It's something you've done by will because your life depends on it. That's the implication of the word cleave here. Do you see how it changes the perspective? Not, th this is not just, you're not just, oh, you know, automatically, you know, we're going to get married, we're going to become one, we're going to attach. No, it's a, it's a very aggressive, everyday action to reach out and to grab into that person and work on that oneness. So when you feel, and I know in our marriage, there's times when we work on oneness, and then, oh, it's good, it's good. And so you, we just stop. And as soon as we stop holding on, working, cleaving, we start separating and we start having our own lives and we have to come back to that holding on and grabbing on to each other and Amen. working on it. Amen. So you must cleave. Number three, number four, you must use conflict to bring you together instead of pushing you apart. Conflict could be good for marriage because if your marriage just always was great, that means you're not really dealing with issues somebody's hiding something that's what in the beginning of our marriage that's what we had yeah. unsolved conflict pushes people apart even those who really love each other let me uh it, one of my favorite movies is uh, why did i get married too anybody seen it you got to see that movie if you haven't that's your assignment for the week by tyler perry uh there's a uh, so these couples go to bahamas on a um, uh, marriage retreat together and jenna jackson is playing this uh, this one lady i forgot her name in this movie and she gets up and says why does she why did she get married uh you know and uh, both of them get up and they're having ultimate problems at home but they're masking it up and so she says we love each other very much yes we do and it's gonna be okay we're still gonna be friends but me and my husband we decided to get a divorce but we still love each other very much and I was like, what? How can you love each other very much? And then I understood that they do love each other very much. But they had, then later in the movie, you find out that they had trauma. They lost a the child in an accident. And instead of dealing with that, 
instead of talking about it, crying, grieving, they both shut down. She became a counselor helping marriages. (laughs) He was into his business. And before you knew it, they were so far apart. And the interesting thing that she said, we still love each other. And a lot of people who get a divorce these days say we still love each other. We just can't live with each other. The pain of undealt problem is so great in marriage that the only thing you know how to do is just to run. Because sometimes pain is, is so big. And so don't go, don't wait till your pain is so big between your husband and wife. Complain if you need to. Because when a marriage couples complain to each other about problems, that means they still care and love each other. There's still hope. When they stop complaining and they start living different lives, be careful. You're in a dangerous situation. It's okay to complain. How will your husband know (laughs) that you have a problem? (laughs) It's okay to complain for a guy that maybe he's not getting enough of what he wants in marriage. You know what I mean by that, guys? Uh, (laughs) Complain. Say it. She should know. He should know. How? And so he's not getting what he wants, so he's acting unloving to her. She feels unloved, and she's not giving him what he wants. And it's a, that what crazy cycle. In the book, uh, Love and Respect, they talk about that crazy cycle. And so you must use conflict to bring you together to one. And not just allow uh, things. The other day, Tanya did something without even asking me. And I felt hurt. And I told her. I said, I'm mad at you. I did. Why? She said. Well, you did this and that. And then we had a long fight. Not fight, but we fight uh, fair these days. We don't yell anymore, you know. And she's presenting me. And then at the end, we said, agree to disagree. Now but, make me a sandwich. I said, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but kidding. The, the, the most interesting, interesting thing that after argument, even this time, I felt closer to you. Yeah. And so sometimes we avoid arguments. And that's with everybody, with your family, with your friends. We avoid confrontations and, and, and fear that it's going to, you know, break us apart. But if you do it right and if oneness is the goal the goal then after the fight you will feel closer and after my argument with her i felt like well maybe it's not as a big of a deal maybe i was overblowing this this whole situation (laughs) (laughs) conflict unresolved conflict can cause so much pain that while you still love each other but the pain of conflict unresolved conflict is so great that you just want to run away and so you must use conflict to bring you closer together and we got 32 seconds we have one more you must invest yourself into your marriage in order to be one you must invest yourself because whatever you invest in you love guys when you invest in your business you love that business. When you, me and my kids, we built, uh, we planted an orchard when they were like six and seven. And you know what? Tanya always threw jabs at us. Like we would always come and talk to her how great this orchard is. And she's like, well, it's okay. Because she didn't invest into it. But then about what? Two years or well, last, last year. Last spring, yes. Last I wanted to kind of finish our, you know, landscaping. our landscaping and plant some trees, some decorative trees and some bushes. And um, you were busy and you were building a shop. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to do this myself. And so, oh, I got, I got dirty. My, my nails. Well, first you were researching. (laughs) You visited every landscape garden center in Sioux Falls. Because I had no, absolutely no knowledge about gardening or or anything like that. I, I bothered those people. I went back there again and again because I wanted to make sure that if I do the, do it, I do it right. And I asked one guy, one, another, another gal, she sent me to the, it was, it was third time from when I came back, they told me, you know what, we, you know, you got this. I bought so many different uh, powders, root uh, stimulators. Like I, I, I'm a pro at planting trees these days. <laughs> and so I dug the holes, I put them in, I watered them. That's another thing. Like, um, and then it became your babies. And they became my babies. It's and every like morning, it's her thing now. Every morning. She knows would, the names of them. 
I uh, oh, sorry. don't have their names, but I would go <laughs> and I planted a beautiful tree right under my big window and I would go every morning and just look, how is it doing? Is it dying? And then, and then you have to make sure that it doesn't die because now you, you know, put so much time into it, you're, you're invested. And so what we're saying is that invest what you care for, you love. Moms, you have those kids. You know why you love them? Because you're wiping their butts. <laughs> Yep. No, I'm serious. You're not sleeping because of them. And you would give your You're life. Invested. You would give your life for them. That's why, that's why, because you care for them. That's why it's okay to leave your husband's home with your children too, so they could be invested, care for them, and love them too. But just wanted to throw at that work, in. At work, I had this guy who was a single dad, and his girlfriend um, didn't really care about kids. She was running around still chasing men, you know. And so he took responsibility for the children. I think he had two, one or two children. And I would look at him, and sometimes he would skip a week of work. And I'm like, dude, you're missing out on money. And he's like, well, my children are more important to me than money. And, uh, and I was like, how? That doesn't make sense. See, for a man who has a wife who really loves her babies, it's like, okay, I felt like embarrassed almost that he was a greater dad than I was to my kids. because And he was single. He, he would give up work. Eventually, he, he was fired because, because his children were more important to him. Because why? It's not normal because he invested his time yeah. in yeah. to so them. So invest busy, into your spouse. When you're busy taking care of your own grass, you will not be looking at somebody else's grass because you don't care about your, their grass. You're so busy making sure yours is green. So when you're busy pouring into your marriage, researching about, about your marriage, guys, I know it's unpopular. It's kind of boring, but crack a book sometimes open, you know, or like maybe, maybe, um, uh, Podcast. but, podcasts, yeah, like things that maybe are easier than, you know, it's easier for women to learn about marriage, but guys, it's, if you invest your time, you're going to be excited then to go and implement what you learned from the podcast or from the book, go and do it for, in your marriage, instead of looking and saying, look at, look at his wife. Guys, and really the loaning of every man and every mo woman to be known, to know, to be completely vulnerable and still loved. That's what that oneness is. Now, I didn't say sex is not important, guys. It is. Especially for us, guys. Women, I didn't say love and romance and affection is not important. It is. Yes. Beauty, it's important. I mean, you got to look good, you know. Take care of yourself if you can, you know. Uh, if money, it's important. I didn't say it's not. Yes. But don't make that the goal. Yeah. Because when you make goal oneness, all those things are included. When you make goal happiness, none of those things are included. It's just happiness. And so how do you build a marriage that you don't want to leave? I don't, I love my marriage. I never want to leave. I, I, some, one day I had thoughts like, what will happen if one of us die? What if she dies first? I, I say to myself, I would never want to go through another dating, another relationship. I, I can't. Uh, we're one. And so how do you build a marriage that you don't want to leave? Build it on oneness. Make the goal of your marriage oneness. Work on it. Not beauty, not love, not sex, not connections, not power. Make it on oneness. I hope you guys were blessed by this topic. Let's give glory to God. Would you take 30 seconds and pray for our marriages? Because there's divorced people here, and it's hard for them. There's people who are in, in separated marriages. There's people who COVID especially exposed the problems, and they're on like on, hanging on the string their marriages because they're not happy. Pray for us. 30 seconds. Okay. Holy Spirit. Move in this place, Lord. Shine your light as a glimpse of hope right now to everybody who feels like their, their relationship is hopeless. I pray that you shine the light and make, make that hope spark. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke lies. Yes. 
that people have believed. I rebuke lies that all they need to be happy is to be happy, Father. And I pray that this revelation takes over their thinking, takes over their heart. The revelation of oneness combined with sparkle of hope. And today, in the name of Jesus, there's a start of something new. There's a start of something better. I pray healing takes place. Love, joy, and peace in families, in our homes. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, thank Thanks for tuning in to New Life Sermon Series Online. If you're blessed by these messages and are interested in helping spread the word of God to others, make an investment today. You can give at newlifechurchsf.org. If you have a story or a testimony to share, let us know on our website as well. We hope you have a blessed day and enjoy today's message by Pastor Alex.